and uh, what a wonderful conference. Uh, so I, I, I uh, have a somewhat parallel center. Uh, actually, everything Don did here, he copied from the Center for the Study of Complex Systems. So uh, let's see which way gets it moving. So there's a quick overview of who we are. And I'll come, uh, uh, John Holland, uh, Scott Page, who is uh, political science, uh, 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 Michael Cohn, Bob Axelrod, Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, Rick Riola, Mark Newman was mentioned a few times uh, in James' talk, and I'll talk about him. Uh, that's one of the hangers on. Mercedes Pascal works with Cy Levin in, in uh, looking at uh, tropical diseases and effect of El Nino. And uh, not in this picture because they're newer in the group. Uh, Pedro Rahani, another epidemiologist, Lada Adamic, who does uh, network supply. Elizabeth Brooks, a demographer, and Charlie Durings, a applied mathematician, looking often at movement. So you know. But we, it, it's it's a very it's a nice family. So I'm I want to uh, that's a very strange talk I'm about to give uh, uh, in some ways. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm often have talked about complex systems to groups who have no idea why modeling is important, why uh, you should ever think systems, and. Uh, you know, why theory and, and applications should even be in the, in the same building. And so I'm preaching to, to the converted, I think, but I'll, I'll go through it anyway, just to give a little er overview. And at the same time, maybe try to bring together some of the threads that we've talked about in preparation for this uh, uh, discussion that uh, Don will lead uh, shortly, in, in, in you know, a couple hours uh, after my two hour talk. So, you know, the point is, and, and everything's a system, right? That's what we care about. And, and ignoring that fact leads to uh, possibly unanticipated consequences. It's sort of fun to get students to think about unanticipated consequences and things they know and care about. Uh, to me, uh, you know, one of the primary examples is the old DDT overuse, right? That this great. Uh, savior for farmers' cropland, practically destroyed much of our uh, uh, bird life. Uh, or maybe, you know, just this fellow brought a couple of rabbits to Africa, I mean to Australia, so he could do a little hunting. Uh, it's at this point I've had uh, often the slide of Life of Brian and the Killer Rabbit, but I fortunately didn't, won't even mention it, okay? Um, but in health systems, you know, the notion of uh, using the strongest antibiotic as possible right away, or even using antibacterial soaps. All these are, you know, I, I think the, maybe the most serious health problem that we all face in our families are, are, are drug-resistant uh, uh, pathogens, and, and these are clear paths to their prominence. Um, bio, I, I'm uh, we're also wear a hat as uh, Head of uh, energy policy at the university and biofuels, at least as originally construct, uh, thought about, uh, you know, uh, tell farmers to uh, designate their corn for fuel and man, it's a win-win situation. We won't need any of them foreign money and it's all there. And, you know, the, the impact on food prices, availability and the, the, you know, even if it worked, it would be such a small drop in the bucket to what we needed. It's, uh, but you know, one of my favorite presidential candidates ran on that and won on that platform four years ago, three years ago. Anyway, so systems, it's about modeling, it's about thinking how things are related, drawing some diagrams, putting some arrows, maybe put it, trying to quantify them. So most of what I care about, I, I, I work in ecology, I actually, uh, uh, but most of what I care about is modeling disease spread for reasons that we'll talk about soon. And a good question is, it's good to have on it one board, what are the things we hope modeling will give us? And I think this, for me, captures a lot of it. Uh, there's a lot happening and something that can tie it together. Uh, people collect data. So when HIV first hit in the 80s, 
uh, ep, you know, field epidemiologists went around to, to San Francisco and asked all kinds of questions, most of which were useless in their information, right? They, without a framework to ask to, to what data to collect. And I'm sure it's true in, in, in all the areas here. Um, one thing I'll talk about is, you know, finding, understanding the underlying parameters. It's been a general theme here, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, you know, and health is an area that we do experiments at, at our own risk, if at all. So with computer models, you can begin to think about, and, and we've seen here also uh, some computer experiment, compare diseases, formulate assumptions, cross-check information. And, and the, the one thing everyone thinks about uh, as, as the main cause of modeling, course of modeling, is making forecasts. And that's certainly in, in, in David's work and, and uh, Michael's work building models to get accurate forecasts is a, a key piece. So uh, Bob Axelrod always likes to talk about the KISS principle for built model building. Keep it simple, stupid. And you know, just capture the raw elements. And these are what I call simple models. First, once you understand everything's a system, the first step is a somewhat unsatisfying thing of building models that barely capture the essence. So, you know, here's a good example of the KISS principle for the start of uh, swine flu. And I, actually, I think uh, Ted or Carl Bergstrom gave me this uh, slide. It's, uh, what, what, what else need we say? Yeah, I think was, uh, I've seen it on Ted's uh, some of these. Yeah, probably Ted. Probably a picture of Carl when he was a young guy. Kissing <laughs> Ted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, you know, in, in some ways, the standard epidemiological approach, the, the uh, biostatistics approach, is, is beginning to it, but it, as, it has pulling the whole system together, I think it leaves a little to be desired. It, it, if, you, if you just do, you know, the old, the smoking cause cancer correlation study, right? Yeah. Well, uh, Soon, first of all, and it's maybe okay for cancer, but I actually think for infectious diseases, the independence criteria is is, is worth worrying about, right? Well, we were talking about this at lunch. Ah. R. A. Fisher, the great, yeah, the great, he believed that the cancer caused smoking. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. We'll come back to that. that I'd like to <laughs> revisit that. So. Um, so I, I, I want to think, as, 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 as we've heard the last few days, sort of dynamic models of uh, things like disease spread. So I'm going to work through an example that we've talked about and seen, and maybe should have looked carefully at first. But uh, um, you know, so the standard modeling process, the one that's sitting behind much of what we've talked about, you, you figure out the, the compartments, you put in the arrows that connect the, apart, the, the uh, various compartments to each other, um, and then you begin to think of what kind of uh, quantifying even further to some kinds of formulas. So again, the simplest one is, uh, you know, what what, what might be the simplest variables? Two cheat sheets here. Um, so studying spread of disease, especially in infect contagious disease, contacts, transmission probability, recovery rate, and maybe background death rate, okay? And that's the beginnings of, of, of the minimal uh, requirement. And so what do we do with those? We want to figure out the, the you know, the, uh, as long as we have a, a, a physicist here, the physics of infection, okay? And the physics of, inf the, the force of infection, the number of new infections is the contacts per susceptible, per unit time, times the number of susceptibles, times the, you know, a, a, a contact doesn't count unless it's with an infective. Uh, and not every contact transmits. Okay, so as I think we've all seen too many times, this is sort of the basis, and then there's the, the things we subtract off, recoveries and background death. So this is an, you know, this is an interesting model. I begin my, my uh, graduate biodynamics classes with it. Um, and the beauty of it, it's completely solvable in almost any 
scenario, right? So the first thing we do is we, uh, this has two variables, S and N. We're assuming constant population in the simple model so we can get rid of, have, have basically just an equation in the infectives. And what equation is it? It's the, the simplest nonlinear equation in existence. It's the logistic equation, the basis of demography in many ways. And uh, it's, you know, and now take a look at this. Uh, so this is you know, the rate of change of infection. If, when this is negative, infection's dying down. When this is positive, infection's growing. This term's positive, so it's the sign of this that determines what's gonna happen. So in particular, this is a fraction, right? The fraction infected. If this is, uh, if this, well, if this is negative, the, uh, this, this whole thing is negative, the disease will die out. If this is positive, then uh, at least for small uh, infection numbers, the disease will spread. Everything is in that one little observation, and that's the, you know, so one of these two graphs have to occur. In this process, every, the, the, the uh, rate of change is positive, and everything goes to endemic equilibrium. In this case, where this is negative, the other root is over there, and, and dy dt is negative. So that leads us to the basic reproduction number that, that I think we've heard at least in four or five of the talks, sort of a key, and it's going to be one of the things I want to focus on a little bit is, it's sort of what this simple model highlights, uh, what we learn from it. That the, not that, uh, so, you know, this is the rate of new infection, this is the rate of weaving, it's input over output. If that, num if that ratio is less than one, the disease will die out. If it's bigger than one, the disease will spread. And notice this is you know, contact rate times infectiousness times uh, disease length, one over eight plus M. So it has a, also an, how many infectives that infect, of course, in the course of his or her own infection. Okay. So again, the two pictures, the two possibilities, and one other part that I, one reason R0 plays such a role, you notice the, and, and uh, uh, this was talked about a number of the talks that, uh, you know, there's this relate, one minus one over R0 is the, the endemic level of infection. Okay. So that's what I think of as a simple model. And I want to argue that this is a kind of model that, that throughout the physical, social, decision sciences permeates our teaching and thought. And much of what we've been doing is to go beyond that, but this is, uh, not everyone agrees with us. In economics, it's sort of the same thing. In fact, it's my favorite whipping boy. I get to teach a course I don't believe in. But, uh, well, that's, it's an exaggeration. Um, but, you know, we make, uh, here are the background boxes, so to speak. We start with simple preferences that never change. Okay, and we put in a budget constraint. <coughs> that, uh, and then we you know, have people choose the optimal constraint point, And that sort of gives a demand function. Assuming uh, rational consumers, we build a fairly complete theory of economic behavior, in some sense of religion. Uh, okay. And even in ecology, okay, I, uh, you know, the, the, one of the basic models is the predator-prey equation. It's a beautiful equation. You get these beautiful, regular patterns. I, first, I, I met my, my wife, Bobby Lowe, when she was sitting in on my lecture on this, and she laughed so hard in the back of the room that I was mad and embarrassed and took her to task. She says, yeah, that's the stupidest model I ever saw in my life. Uh, and, you know, we got talking about it, and we still are. Probably was our first big fight, too. It's beautiful, right? Isn't that what counts? <laughs> so here are the things that I think of as a simple system that we part of what this meeting is to get beyond. But it's, it permeates, I think, ecology, economics, biology, uh, and in some sense physics and, and, you know, classical physics. Everyone's the same. That system, so in economics, we talk about representative confirm and representative agent. 
and there, there's systems in equilibrium. Economics is called general equilibrium theory. Remember the text had that name, okay? Um, mixing is random in, in the, there's no feedback, no learning. Those indifference curves that I wrote down never change. People, I don't know why we even bother with advertising or education because people don't change their preferences, right? Uh, the systems are deterministic and there's no connection between macro and micro. So in the economics department where I'm at, the micro people don't even know who the macro people are. And in the biology department in Michigan, the two departments divorced. Okay, and probably other places too. So uh, that's sort of the world that where the religions are built. So, you know, we really get insights. We get tipping points. We get predictable cycles. We get, we get market theory. We get solutions like markets work. R0 is, a, uh, you know, answers all our questions. Um, but I think it makes sense, and I think we agree, to go the next step and ask, if we put a little more realism, which of these are, you know, which of these can we really rely on? Which of these might enforce, uh, could we go to a policymaker and say, we make this recommendation because we're convinced that it's robust? Okay. So, as Einstein said, keep it simple, but not too simple. So again, here are the characteristics of what I think of a simple system, and I'm now going to negate all these, right? Oh, well, so here's the simple system we just looked at, and you know, this is three equations and three unknowns. It's mathematically not, not trivial. Uh, here's what HIV looks like in a, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in a uh, neighborhood in Atlanta where there are males and females and, and uh, se men having sex with men and drug dealing you know, in a complicated network that of, the, of the real world that we'd like to capture. And the question is, what do we have to do to capture that? So here is, finally, what I think of as the hallmarks of the next, next step. And I think all the talks we've heard fit into these categories. People are different. And, uh, you know, uh, Ji Wun mentioned that very strongly in her discussion of San Diego and, and uh, uh, those differences are important. They're, the systems are dynamic. Uh, random mixing is, can be not so bad as a, as, as a first view, but there are interesting networks, right? We've heard two, at least two talks on networks and the role they play. Feedback. This is the toughest one. Engineers believe in feedback all the time. Social scientists, at least economists, and probably ecologists. Nah, no, not at all, says Michael, and I agree. So um, the world's stochastic, and it's out in the tails that the interest is. I said it in my class, and I got in trouble, but that's another story. Um, and, and finally, emergence, multi-level. And, and, you know, part of the uh, uh, cleverness of uh, my friend in the back there is to pull people together who care about different levels. Right? Myron who works on the cellular level, okay, uh, and, and uh, we've seen the genomic level, for example. So again, here's our, here's the group, and you know, so John Holland works on on uh, genetic algorithms modeling um, the adaptation and learning. Scott has the, uh, written the books, he's maybe the, uh, the advantages of diversity and heterogeneity. Uh, Michael on networks, Bob Axelrod on, on sort of dynamics and interaction, Mark Newman we've heard about networks, and, and Mercedes on, on non-equilibrium dynamics. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Brook, the, uh, works a lot on uh, Tom Sh you know, taking Tom Schelling's simple tipping models and getting real information about neighborhood change in Los Angeles with, the diff with three different, the obvious three different uh, ethnic groups and two or three different uh, um, wealth categories. 
So let me talk about each of these and how they fit. Um, homogeneity. So, uh, you know, Zhigun mentioned it. Andrew talked about the differences between men and women in the spread of influenza. Um, it, uh, there is no representative consumer, and I'm not sure the theory that applies on no disease risk factors. So the simplest model assumes everyone behaves the same. Uh, scene one, so in, I'm, I'm teaching a course right now on fishing strategies. And you know, the standard model of fisheries is that the fish are all the same size, they're evenly distributed across the lake. The fishermen all do the same thing, and it's one big homogeneous pot of nonsense. Okay. <laughs> And, and the differences are what count, as, as we've heard. And, and Scott Page has a great book. I, I encourage this. I get 5% of every sales, but still, uh, you know. It's so Eva, we, we saw data on, uh, from Andrew on, on, uh, on uh, men versus men compared to women in the spread of influenza. Here's a similar picture for HIV. OK, they're not too different, but you know, the, the men had the large initial uh, epidemic. Uh, the women's story has been somewhat different. And notice this uh, sort of increase. I mean, what we would like to do, I think, ultimately, and I think that's sort of the theme of this meeting, if I may, explain the patterns, explain the, you know, use models and theory and, and correlation to figure out what's happening in the graphs. Even uh, talk about, uh, if you look by, by uh, uh, so you know, this, this is uh, uh, men, men having sex with men, this is drug use, this is uh, uh, people doing both, and uh, the dark solid line is heterosexual transmission, okay? This is not a homogeneous problem. And understanding the components, um, I think is, uh, you know, I don't think we have much hope of, of understanding how to combat the, the epidemic without understanding how these different components play a role. And again, I'm especially interested in, you know, this, that we understand the initial takeoff, but, and then the drop, but why the rise again? Okay, and, and I think uh, some of the things James talked about, I'd, I'd like to, or hinted at actually, I, I think play a role in that, so. So, I mean, here maybe is, so the, my, and I think the Michigan approach to, there are many people doing complex systems and my least favorite approach is make the most complicated model you can right away, throw in everything and see what happens, right? And there's almost no insight into that. I, 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 I and I think my colleagues are very much build the simple model first. So I'm not disparaging the simple model. I think you've got to start there and keep adding the obvious missing pieces, partly for, you know, checking the, as, as you move from analytic to computer simulation, you want some kind of robustness checks, right? So here to us, this is the model I, I spent 10 years working on, where we're, you know, we're adding two pieces to the basic SIS model. One is stages of infection, which we know are crucial for HIV, and different groups. And the simplest way to think of the groups, so, you know, is uh, risk preference, contact rates. And then think of this as, San, you know, San Francisco in, in the late 80s. So we're just focusing on, on men having sex with men, okay? So well, I'll come back to that, but it's, you know, I, I'm, I put it in as, as I think the, the movement from simplicity to complexity needs to go carefully. So the second ingredient is, you know, the world's not in equilibrium. And understanding the, you know, it'd be pretty boring if it isn't. I mean, the path to getting there is sort of what we're writing. Uh, so, you know, 
if you if you look at the model, the true model from uh, trappings in Canada, they have some of the the uh, regularity that the predator prey model does. But in fact, I think uh, there was a paper on, I, I haven't that argued that if you, in order for this model, the Volterra-Latka model, to be true for the Canadian data, you need the hare to eat the the lynx. Picky, picky. Uh, and of course, uh, a, a topic uh, close to Don's heart in, in research he's done is uh, some dynamics can be pretty complicated, even stochastic. Hmm? And, and understanding that, one, I, I just heard a talk by uh, David Rand, who's a young postdoc uh, uh, in the ecology group at Harvard. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, what's the point on his name? Who had, Martin Novak, thank you very much. Hey, you're just get reading mine because it's twice you've done that today. Uh, so uh, he, he does sort of dynamic game theory, ecology, and, and it's been, you know, putting the prisoner's dilemma, which of course is the paradigm of social science, and the question is, what role should punishment play? So, you know, there's it's a step beyond cooperating, punish those who defect. And the static theory, which is how you would do it, says punishment's great, really makes it work. And part of, uh, part of uh, Rand's role is, in fact, if you do it, and put in dynamics and repeated iterated games, punishment actually can hurt and make the process worse. So sometimes it really does make a, a difference. So again, dynamics, trying to understand you know, you can't take a static view of this picture because we want to know about the change and, and, and things that uh, David and Michael talked about. Um, in, in a, you know, looking at the, at, at, at the sinusoidal regularities, but also trying to understand the, the changes in those curves is, is sort of what I think we care about. Random mixing. Uh, sometimes called the bathhouse model for HIV, right? Uh, well, fortunately, we have one of the, one of the world's great network theorists uh, sitting down. And, and in fact, there are so many people doing networks at Michigan that the Complex Systems Center ran a, a year-long seminar with different people, mostly from the university, uh, giving uh, different, you know, talks in different areas. Uh, I mentioned Jerry Davis to you, John, and, you know, and, and working on networks of CEO of uh, boards of directors and what impact that has. And, and uh, a lot of Adamic who looks at uh, networks related to, to uh, uh, the internet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, 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 and as, as James pointed out, the structure of the network can have a lot to do with the outcome. So here's a picture, similar to ones you've seen. You've seen this one. Uh, this is uh, Moody and Berman's uh, work on, on a high school in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, I think. Uh, and it's just a dating pattern. Hmm? Well, I mean, Jim did it when he was in Columbus, but yeah. it's an ad hoc, so we don't know the location. Ah, I see. Okay. So oh, good. I'm, I'm glad, glad to hear that. Because uh, I, you know, like, and, and uh, contacts are not random <laughs> in this group. Uh, my favorite, you know, there. Look at, there's a phenomenon there, uh, and and I'm not sure you. I'm sure you realize this, but it actually has a name. <laughs> um, that was long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's this uh, core people with. Uh, you showed us this. this single diagram with uh, nine around, well, here's, and then you built a picture on, but here's a real network with some of that. So uh, this was not about disease spread, but it's sort of the precursor, right? Uh, and, you know, we've seen, and some of us like and some of us don't like the work of uh, uh, Christakis and Fowler on, on uh, uh, other kinds of contagion. Uh, so I, uh, but, uh, you know, is obesity, uh, the net, certainly it's a network. All I, I'm putting us to indicate 
Uh, it's an interesting network, okay? So Mark's work, Mark's job is basically to try to classify networks. So Mark has, I don't know if you, he has the most cited uh, math work uh, roughly to 2004, 2005, his paper in the SIAM uh, review uh, on, on the mathematics of networks. And basically classifies them, you know, so what do you need to see to figure out what kind of network it is and then understand a little bit how does the, the, the geometry of the network affect the outcomes. And, and I'm going to, it has a, a, an a, a interesting effect on one of the questions I asked, namely the uh, reliability on R0 as the ultimate epidemiology parameter. We saw graphs like this. This is a little older than the ones, uh, than the ones uh, we saw before. Uh, are they uh, truly power laws? They're not. They're not. not. But Mark signed a 2004 paper. Hmm? Mark, Mark Hancock signed a 2004 paper. Exactly, looking at the... Uh, looking at those data. Oh, good. OK. So also the curve on the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a little problem up here. Right? We, can, we can offer But, you know, if we fudge the data and ignore these people, it's... Well, yeah, like chop. But for any, any analytic function, of course, if you allow me to yes. set a, a sufficiently small... Of course. Section, it will be linear. Of course. In fact, that's what calculus is all about, right? Exactly. Anyway. Also, the missing zeros in there because of the double logarithmic accuracy. Yeah. 20% of Americans are unlucky in any given year. That matters for the numbers. Right? It does indeed. We, uh, we'll yeah. define unlucky a little later. But <laughs> so. <laughs> so. I, I, for me, uh, much of, at least uh, in, in the uh, 90s, a lot of my focus of the work was if you make different assumptions about contact structures, not, and this is pre-networks, uh, what can you say about disease spread? And I, uh, you know, where should you opt, uh, vaccinate, as, as, uh, as, as we heard in, in, in uh, Andrew's talk, uh, you know, there's, there are major issues, especially when you put economic and, and, and political constraints in. So, uh, you wouldn't mention uh, preferred mixing in the work that uh, Jacques K. Copeman and I did, um, uh, trying to, the first question is, what's the most complex mixing that you can do analytics on? And I think my guess is that some of the preferred, the trouble with preferred mixing doesn't go well with data, and we're very much interested in studying the HIV data, so we move structured mixing sort of sits on the boundary where you can get observational data on the mixings and on, on, on the contact groups and, and, and try to uh, uh, build bridges to, to the real mixing. So here's a couple. Uh, uh, so J James talked about a sort of mixing. Here is uh, races and HIV national data. Uh, you know, blacks, the, 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 the boundary rules. Here's the same thing by age group. People pretty, you know, uh, uh, I, I believe this is uh, uh, males having sex with males, national data, again, uh, the diagonal, the sort of mixing is, is uh, key, but not strict, right? And if that strictness, if the, the, these pieces play a role in, in the analysis. Um, so let me, let me just talk a little bit about uh, this old work of, of our group on uh, trying to use the model to understand the transmission path. And again, we use this model we, we, of HIV. We assumed five different contact groups, four or five uh, different stages, try to put very realistic data from San Francisco in particular into uh, the contact structure, into the length of the stages. And what we want to do is one of those goals. I try to estimate how contagious HIV is. 
much more difficult than because we don't often know and people don't often report well, you know, what was the sex act and who was the partner that, that caused the uh, transmission. So the, the, the and, and most of, I mean, we knew from, from uh, carrier, aircraft carrier data that uh, people who have been infected long enough to detect infection are not very contagious. So their contagiousness is, you know, so, uh, certainly l less than half a percent, maybe 0.1 percent per act. Okay. And, and some of that also from uh, uh, drug infection data. So the, the question is, what about in that first period? How strong is the infective contagiousness here relative to the other periods? And so that's sort of a simple modeling question. You can put in different parameters here and see, we got pretty good data from San Francisco, the hepatitis C co uh, blood collections uh, had sort of captured the epidemic in a, a rather striking way. Uh, so we could go back and ask what, uh, so, you know, here is the San Francisco back calculated data. For most cities, by the way, here's the data you get. <laughs> you sort of, you waited, this uh, came in in discussion of influenza. It comes in far too late to be interesting or useful. But San Francisco we could. And so changing the, the infectivity in the primary stage, that first month, the month when before the immune system kicks in and does its thing, became uh, uh, sort of the focus of this work. And you see it's not until you get the uh, trans, uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to read my numbers better, up to 50 to 100 times more infective in that first period than the later periods where you get anything like the real world data. And, and we argued this uh, from many different points of view and, uh, um, and, and, and it, it, I think you, you couldn't even come close to doing this without combining mo uh, somewhat careful modeling with somewhat careful data collection. And, and there's good reasons for it, and I'll, I'll actually come back to it. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of uh, antigen just sort of peaks during primary infection, the immune system kicks in, and, and you know, this is actually before, before art, before the, the uh, you know, much of this work was done before uh, drug treatment was uh, even had taken off. Um, Oh. So again, and, and I want to come back to this picture a little later, but this is, you know, when you take blood samples, um, you can find different things at different stages. So here's the peak of, 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 of viral load. It, it sort of happens at roughly 20 days. But there are other things that don't come in until much later in the process. And one of the things I want to argue is you could try to really understand. We can now, and have for a while, been able to uh, uh, understand how long a person's been infected, and maybe even how long their effect infecting partner had been infected by looking at different kinds of data. And so uh, this is an article by uh, uh, Myron Cohn, is it? Yeah. Uh, from uh, in, in New England Journal of Medical Medicine uh, this summer, uh, talking about the, the important role of primary infection. Uh, so here are our studies. Uh, by the way, you notice uh, with some pride that they were a good 15 years. The, these studies were very indirect. So a good 15 years before any of the other data came out. And, but even the most pessimistic, you know, we're talking about a one or two month period, a very small part of the whole uh, ep uh, uh, period of infection that accounts for at, at even the lowest 10% of the infection and probably much more. Uh, and, and this is uh, some quotes from, 
from uh, Myron's article. Uh, certainly, we, we now understand much better the viral burden in the blood is the highest correlation with, of HIV transmission. Uh, every, every time the burden goes up by a uh, uh, factor of 10, the risk of transmission goes up by almost two and a half. Uh, and part of this, and this, is a, uh, this goes back to James' talk when we, he was talking about SIV infection and agreeing that, in fact, for, for, for uh, SIV infection, the primary infection period seems to be critical and maybe the best explanation for some of the phenomena of, of, of how transmission occurs in, 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 in uh, simians and, uh, you know, why? Well, one good reason, and let's see if I have it here, yes. Um, the, we know HIV evolves dramatically within a person. And the, the, the HIV, we, we now know that we can look at the genetics of the virus and have some understanding of how long it's, you know, looking, looking at the tree, how long it's been, how long the person's been infected. And, and this, this comment I think is especially interesting, differences within a patient over time are much bigger than differences across patients okay, who, who've been infected similar. So you can actually, if, if someone's been infected at, at, at this period, then this is where the transmission, the, the viral tree starts for the new patient. You can get pretty good information about not just, again, how long a person's been infected, but how, at what stage their infector was. And this is what Jim Copeman and I are working on now to try to really nail down much better estimates of the role of primary infection and, and the beta. But again, this is part of the theme of this meeting, pulling together genomic cellular and population studies and understanding the connections. Feedback. <laughs> so to me, uh, so engineers, math, you know, applied math, physicists love feedback, economists sort of hate it. Uh, doesn't seem to play much a role, but in disease spread, we have to, we have to think it important. I'll, I'll say it again, but on, so if HIV is what, uh, 80s, 90s, what, 20, going on 25 years in the U.S., roughly? There's, and, and, you know, piles of mod journals full of modeling papers, almost none of them deal with behavior change. And yet we know, I mean, Ellen Perlson had some earlier, uh, on, on arguing that, uh, uh, was it Alan? I'm not sure now. Anyway, there had to have been a lot of behavior change in San Francisco in order for the epidemic to have the path it did. He's basically, what we did for primary infection, he did with, with decreased contacts and argued that in order for the, for the uh, infection to have the path it did, basically there had to be a 50% drop per year in number of contacts in the late 80s. And yet, that's not part of any model I know. And so one of the foci that we have now is putting behavior change in. Um, so, and, and I'll come back to this in, in an hour or two, but uh, the, uh, the, you know, in a very simple model, there are places of, of uh, high contact where, where the, the riskier uh, transmission occurs and, and places of sort of normal or general sites in, in the model as a frame, geometric framework and that people move back and forth with some regularity and some patterns. And then the question is, so this is exogenous change. It's still not the right, it's, the, we're, you know, it's gotta be endogenous change that, that gets in the models at the end. Uh, what role does behavior change have in the spread. So putting different parameters, values on, on the switch. And in particular, how is that affect by primary infection? 
So again, if 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 your if your contacts are mostly in a place of high risk, you're likely to to uh, th that the person you're you're, you're uh, uh, contacting is, will be an earlier part of infection. So your, your perspective actually changes what defines a high risk in, uh, location, doesn't it? Because I mean, a high risk location is one where you have lots of people who were infected 20 days ago. Uh, yeah, I actually right. So I'm you're right. I and I'm being a little sloppy with the term risk. So let me say exactly what I mean. I mean it's a place where the level of contacts is much higher. Uh, independent, so the, that, the part you're describing has to come out endogenously. It's a, and, and the fact that it seems to is, is the interesting piece. So I mean here's what the equations look like. And in fact, uh, so you know, again it's an SI model, but there are, you know, High, people of high risk and, and, and low the, the risk and, and they change with some parameter. And the effective contact rate is the same? CH is the high contact rate, C is the general contact rate. So in the high place, okay, the beta is the same. And, and this is just the, you know, the, the real model. I, I, has many more stages. It's, you know, it's just there's just stage transmission. Uh, this complicated picture. Just take from it that changing those parameters changes these curves. How 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 often people move from high change their 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 uh, their behavior has not only a big effect on. On, on, on the prevalence of the epidemic, but also on the importance of primary infection. And, and I think that's pretty intuitive. Um, I'm going to sort of skip the uh, stochasticity, sort of obvious, but it does make a difference. And if you, there are, Jim and I have talked about uh, modeling and vaccinations and uh, whether you've whether, again, well, actually, it's a question that came up in our, uh, here, too. Uh, do you model in the place of, of where people get together? Or do you go out, or, or I'm say, do you vaccinate in, in, the, in, in the schools and downtowns, or do you vaccinate where the contacts are lower? And in the, in the deterministic model, the answer is it doesn't make any difference because there's this big averaging. But in a stochastic model, where, in fact, some of these can be empty at some time, you know, no disease, makes a huge difference. And it's, it's sort of, for us, a key that something you need to worry about in thinking of policy and, and, and recommendations. And then, and then finally, the, the multiple scale, that combining macro, micro, cellular, genomic, pop, individual population, and, and bringing in, in uh, Ramanan's work even crossing uh, country boundaries and, and trying to tie those together. I, I think, so we didn't, in, in, in Bruce's discussion, which I, I learned more uh, about, I, I learned more things new to me than in any of the other talks, though just because I knew almost nothing about it. Uh, you know, I, th I think one of the challenges to try we had, we had talks at malaria at three different levels, and yet we didn't quite tie them together yet. Um, one of our, we actually have courses on agent-based modeling and, and try to, again, it's become a little bit of a, a fashion uh, and not done so carefully. And, and we're really trying to make sure it's sort of a, a, a topic, an approach of last resort and worry about how it connects. So in the spirit of that criticism, can I ask you just a sure. provocative question? Good. That's why we're here. <laughs> Is there a single problem that we've, under, we, that, that we've understood because of agent-based simulation? Um, <laughs> well, well, you don't have to throw your elbows. <laughs> um, well, let's I mean, say I don't I have a good example. Relatively safe, that's Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Cause I, I, I think I can analysis. understand. Well, I'm not sure that we can really deal with heterogeneity 
I mean, to me, agent-based modeling kicks in when the degree of heterogeneity gets too complex. Because if you're going to do, if you're going to do uh, sort of uh, differential equation models where you really ca try and capture it, you're going to have some very thin bins. And, uh, you know, I think the whole philosophy of the dynamics breaks down. So I have nothing in mind. That's a good question. I think it's a good challenge. And I'll, but I, I, I just, I really do think agent-based model comes in where the heter heterogeneity plays a huge role. Um, Let me be even more provocative. <laughs> provocative than thou, okay. Uh, I mean, you know, in, when they eliminated measles from Brazil, they, they employed a lot of modelers to come up with SIR models uh, of, of, of what ages and how often they should vaccinate, et cetera, et cetera. And then Sarah de Quadris just basically ordered as much vaccine as he could get his hands on and just blanketed the country with as much vaccine as he could get his hands on and essentially didn't you know, even look at any of the modeling work that was done. And so, but but if there are no constraints, I'm not sure you have to worry about. Well, but the problem. I mean, the modeling. Well, the modelers like to take credit for things like eliminating measles, and you know, the boots on the ground public health people often know that the models of success stories are somewhat oversold relative to the way it played out. Ooh, now you're being provocative. Yeah. But uh, clearly there are cases, right? I mean, in well, a case no. where, <laughs> well, no, I mean. Yeah, really. I mean, you could make the argument that in the UK, um, the, uh, you know, and this goes back to Roy Anderson and, and his group, that the, <laughs> the, the foot and mouth disease epidemic in the UK was understood better through the, the agent-based modeling that was done. Do agent well, at least because the agent-based they used to, you know, a very complex spatial infection kernel, but it, was, yeah. I mean, it wasn't really an agent-based model, was it? No, no, I think you're right. Yeah. But so we had gonorrhea. I mean, we we we, we didn't get gonorrhea. Well, be careful with my favorite. <laughs> gonorrhea is my favorite. Uh, we didn't understand gonorrhea at all. It made no sense until yeah. you have a model now. Has that helped us eradicate it? No, we clearly no. haven't eradicated it. But at least we, we got a sense of what's happening. You know, when you look at the average, you, you know, when you average across the population, there's no way there should be any gonorrhea. But when you when you account for the heterogeneity and you, you build in a model like, like what Carl's doing, you just go, oh, hey, that's why we have gonorrhea. So there are you know many cases. Uh, so I, I'm uh, like like Ramanana looking at. Uh, uh, MRSA and well maybe that's not a good example but in, in a, there, there are many possible interventions as he described to, to uh, stop the spread of MRSA in, in, in through hospitals and you know you can do a little seat of the pants uh, hand washing argument but uh, with a model I, you, know, I, you know we made a list careful list of what are some of the interventions and done an elasticity study as, as, as James did in his to try to understand the, the relative effectiveness of different interventions. And um, so I'm, a, in, in this, I'm gonna cop out on, on the, temporarily anyway. I, I'm, in, in our group, I'm the mathematician yeah. who, who's invested in the modeling, right? I wouldn't have any role, uh, I mean, I'm, but. I'm not saying, I mean, I mean the pretty mouth disease is an excellent example Story, and I, and I think there are many other modeling success stories. I know, but but, <laughs> but but I mean, but I'm just saying that they're not not every model is a success story. Yeah, and, and for I, sure. And I think they're sometimes sold. Well, I I'm mean, again for me the model is thinking the system, how putting together the building blocks and understanding the system, with how far you go with that is is open, you know, to the success of the modeling, and, and I I. I'd like to understand why those uh, MSM HIV curves are going up again. And um, I, I, I do think the first step is to build some models of contacts and try and understand what's behind it. Um, 
you know, and, and I do think there are some there are models behind looking at some of the predictions of 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 uh, which strain of uh, influenza is uh, worth worrying about next year. I mean, I think, I mean, I think so the classical agent-based model of literature, I'm not even sure it does such a great job with heterogeneity. And it's, it's always a puzzling, it's a puzzling area. I mean, I cut my teeth in that world and then mostly left it because it felt fun but empty. Um, you always feel like, I, I will defend it into just saying that if you do this stuff, you feel like you learn something. And the question was, what did you learn something about? And it's always hard to put your finger on it. But to somewhat defend, I think, the future of agent-based modeling, I mean, I think the future is, is one, one direction for it, is in exploiting its capacity to represent heterogeneity to have things that are informed by data. So it's in the opposite direction of the, tradi mm -hmm. the original traditional version of, you know, let's have very highly simplified agents that do things that don't map directly into any real world action that are disembodied from places and times or whatever, to have the fact that basically you can have representations where things can be calibrated with actual data from the field. Um, and then now we're getting to the point where statistically, I mean, this is a whole interesting computational task kind of area that uh, I work in some. How do we then be, actually fit this thing to data? Uh, but that gives us the capacity to have, on the one hand, represent social mechanisms that we believe in, at least roughly, if you think of approximation, and have the pieces, parts calibrated data and have the global outcomes calibrated data and actually put data against the model and see to make them be wrong um, and falsify things. Um, and then that allows you to deal with spatial heterogeneity and temporal heterogeneity and all those kinds of things that we think may matter for certain things. So I mean, it, it seems to me that, that, that that's a kind of longer term. Now, I don't think it's all there yet, but that's where I see it going. Um, but it is interesting because it represents, a, in a sense, a complete departure of philosophy from what most, not everyone, but I mean, most people in agent-based modeling that originally used it to do. Yeah. Just have like a Thomas Schelling kind of world where you get these kind of cute insights and you believe you know something, but it, it can be hard after the fact to come back and say, about what do you know of this thing? Well, the Schelling one is a little bit a surprise. Quiet over there. Wait, well, we've started our discussion already. <laughs> uh, but let me. Well, so I, this bomb and now we all have I do think uh, that the, our understanding of the role of primary infection in HIV came through modeling. Um, and it was the, 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 I had large fights with, you know, people in the field who said, that's not our experience. And I'm still having some large fights with various mathematicians who said their models don't give that at all. But I, I, I think the tide seems to be turning and I think there are intervention pieces that that plays a role in. I, I also had a student who worked on, who, who, who did a model of H, of, uh, the effect of smoking on the spread of tuberculosis. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm, she's now a Karen, uh, Kristen Hussmiller, who's now at uh, North Carolina. And if you do the standard correlation models, you come up with a number that says if you could reduce smoking, you would cut back uh, TB. But those models don't do the indirect pieces, the, the fact that smokers gather together, that if, you know, th there's a whole bunch of indirect pieces that play a role. And she found through her work, and, and I think it's been pretty well accepted, that in, the impact of smoking is twice what had been come about through sort of statistical methods. I, I, you know, I think that's a, the kind of insight that at least I can name off the top of my head. And you're right. when, when uh, when, when I have students working on modeling, the goal is not to write the model, the goal is to understand some phenomena. So in, in the bird malaria, we're trying to understand a little bit, like the, uh, like the HIV spread, there are parameters that are very hard to get at. In this case, the contact rate between mosquitoes and, 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 and the uh, white crowned sparrows in Colorado. And, uh, you know, there's only one param one very narrow range of parameters that that will uh, have the data meet. Uh, you know, again, it's like the beta. So, I, uh, I actually, the the questions on are, is modeling any good? That's not the question. No. Yeah, so, what have we learned from it? But I'm not sure we have to, we can stop trying because I think there are insights that. Uh, I, About three, four minutes. Okay. So I think I'm, well, okay. What, what was I, what have I, uh, so, uh, 
Um, in, in some sense, the, the essence of complex systems is very much in the light of the conversation we're happening, we're, we're having right now. It's saying you've you got to do a simple model to understand how things connect. Those simple models often give you conclusions, like markets work. I mean, economics is one big model, right? Uh, uh, a few randomized control trials in economics that's starting to change a little bit. A little bit, yeah. But the, uh, it's one big model. The question is, what happens when you remove those five or six extraordinarily strong assumptions? Markets no longer work, as we all feel. And I think the complex system approach is about challenging the simple assumptions. And in, uh, in disease spread, you know, it, it's trying to understand. So I have two, two hats. One is I, I've made a career in the last five or six years of computing R0 in every you know, getting analytic forms for R0 in many different models, okay? And uh, I was going to walk you through one, but it's, it's a little technical and it, we, we could survive without it. Um, on the other hand, uh, is there always an R0? I actually am coming to understand that R0 is related to random mixing in some sense. As the mixing gets more complicated, uh, R0 uh, may not even make sense. And uh, I, I, so I'm, I'll close with some work of uh, Mark Newman. Uh, so these are all the, here, here is, uh, you know, R0 for the uh, 8 equation um, uh, spread of, uh, of uh, staph infection in a hospital where, where both patients and healthcare workers are the are the uh, uh, transmitters. And here's that model I presented before, and the R0 for it is not too bad. And the, the goal is that it's usually a con uh, some kind of average contact rate times, times a uh, transmissibility times a, a length of infection, uh, which, and again, if it does highlight what parameters you need to impact to get the infection down. Um, so Mark has, uh, and a number of other people have, have computed R0 for networks. And it's a pretty straight, as James suggested earlier, it's, it's based on a degree of nodes, how many. Uh, and, and so I actually have a, 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 a proof of his uh, formula that I won't go through now, but it's at the, uh, K is sort of the mean degree and the threshold for the R0 is roughly that. And you could try it with uh, um, different distributions that we're comfortable with, and it, it works out exactly like the R0 we know and love. But if you put in a power law in, into the expression, you get something that, in fact, goes to zero. So the threshold is zero for, pow for a strict power law, which, again, is a, an extreme. There's something wrong with the model, actually. Might, <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe you guys might say there is no power law. And well, what, what I'm saying is, if you went to the extreme yeah. and had a power or something close to a power law, that the R0 um, begins to break down as the criterion for disease spread. Well, and then, but then also, you know, you take another step in the classical theory and you say, okay, well, let's calculate the final size and find out that with the power law, oh, the final size is zero, right? And, and so, I mean, uh, the final size is zero, is that right? I'm yeah, not, the point that, that, that uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. That, that Bob May made in 2001, it's like, oh, it's sort of fun that you get this the disappearance of an epidemic threshold when you know when you have a singularity in the in the in the mean, hmm. uh, but you also get uh, an, you get a zero final size. Okay, I'm not hundred percent. Okay, I'd like to see that yeah. piece. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, uh, it's one of those things that you, whenever you see results like that from a model, it's like the whole population model thing. You know, it's kind of hyperbolic growth. It says, okay, it's going to, so it's, it, you know. 
you know it can't happen, so usually that should be a clue. Something somewhere is wrong. So, in, in, in fact, populations are finite, yeah. Yeah? and uh, you know that's sitting behind all this. So, all our models are rough, especially continuous time, continuous population models. Uh, but I, I think I can and hope to continue the cases. When does ours, you know, ours? I, I can compute R zero in, in very strong cases, very complex cases, but it has to have some. The mixing can't get too complicated, and I'm not sure that if it does get too complicated, that even in cases where the disease doesn't disappear. So next time, I'll give a report on that. I'm done. <laughs>